cared for you enough and myself enough to give his son to die for us. Amen? Let's go before him in prayer and get into the word. Dear Lord, I want to thank you today that you truly are awesome. You're wonderful. You've done exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think according to your power that works within us. And God, I just pray that you'll bring healing in the lives of each one of us where maybe there's not so many precious memories, but you'll turn those things, Father, into precious memories. You'll help us to see that you work all things together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to your purpose. So, Father, whatever we've had to face and meet in the past, you've used that to strengthen us for the present. And help us, Father, to see that even through much of our upbringing that many of us may have been involved in, that maybe there were times of legalism, but sometimes it's because maybe a mother, in case my mother really didn't know, but I thank God that you opened her eyes before you took her home. And I thank you, God, for all the rich blessings we have in Christ Jesus. We pray for our land and nation. Pray for our president all the way down. And Lord, I thank you that you are the one who is protecting our military. We pray that you'll take care of the men and women that are separated from their families right now for a purpose. And that is that you have them at strategic points, Father, that you might be the one who not only gave us the right, but you're protecting the right through what you have ordained. You've ordained a government. You've ordained a military underneath the government. And Father, you intend for all things to be worked out after the counsel of your perfect will. So we thank and praise you for all rich blessings found in Christ Jesus our Lord and all of God's children said, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. We're talking about today highly favored mothers. And I want every mother to see that, that they're highly favored. You say, well, how can I say that I'm highly favored when I've had this loss and I've had some other loss? God will take those tears that you're weeping in the night and he'll turn them into joy in the morning. Wait, wait till you're reunited with your loved ones, so maybe your children or your grandchildren or maybe even some of your mothers and your, your grandmothers. Reuniting forever. This is a temporary time that you and I are going through, but understand during this temporary time, God intends for you to be highly favored. So mothers who are highly favored are speaking favor into the lives of their children. I know some of, the, some of us have, have named our children and we don't even know why we named them a certain name, but go back and look at the definition of their name. I know I have one grandchild, middle name is Grace, so every time the mother might say Remington Grace, she's speaking grace into that child's life. Maybe you have a son named John. I mean, every time you speak his name John, you're speaking grace into his life. And now there's so many other names that you and I realize are drawn from the Bible or we look at the context of how the Bible would describe or define their name and you and I understand that we're speaking that word of God into their life. It certainly is a blessing to know that. And in fact, I know with so many people, I know George Eliot was one that made this statement, many of us do the things that we do because we had a mother that said we could do them. You take even with Thomas Edison's mother that had a note come home from the teacher saying that this boy cannot learn, saying that he has a learning disability, so there's nothing we can do with him. You might as well keep him at home. And so he went up to his mother and said, what does the letter say? And she said, it says that you are far past anything they could possibly teach you. You have a mind of a genius. And he didn't know that until years later he discovered that letter. He had a mother that spoke favor into his life. A mother that said he's highly favored. And look at what he went on to do. I mean, you see the battle between Westinghouse and and Thomas Edison between D.C. and A.C. Current. But I know today, even in our field, non-destructive testing, a portion of it with magnetic particle testing is D.C., direct current, drawing imperfections from below the surface of the metal. And so God does so many things in showing us how powerful He is, how He sees us, how He shouts over us, how He sings over us, and how we're constantly loved by Him. And I want you to see this in this first scripture. It's found in the Song of Solomon, the first chapter, the second verse. Now, I want you to understand this. That so many of us can say, well, you know what? The Song of Solomon is written to a lover, two people that love each other, but it's also written, as I've mentioned so many times, the father to Israel, the son to the church. And there's a word here in the Hebrew, the word love. It's, do, it's dokia. 
Dokia does not mean just love, it means loves. It's continuous, it's always new. God just, just doesn't love you, God loves you. And so when you think about the fact that many times I, I might need mercy, so God shows me the mercy of love. I might need encouragement, so God is strengthening me with love. He sends His love strength into my life. Whatever it is, God pours love into your life all the time. And it's not just yesterday's love. His love is new every morning, just like it says in the book of Lamentations. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is God's faithfulness. And His mercies are new every morning, but His loves are new every morning as well. Amen? So get up this morning. Thank God for the fact that, you know what? I thank you, God, that you love me with an everlasting love. I thank you, God, that your love is always flowing through me because Jesus Christ lives within me. I know that you're defined as love, but you're defined also as loves. God loves you and I with a tremendous love. I think about as I, I talk to older people, I mentioned this on Wednesday night when I was down south, I was talking to a man that uh, has been very successful, 82 years old, went through a cancer battle last year, and God certainly blessed him with health again, but we're praying for him as well as his wife who is suffering from kidney cancer. And then the example that their parents left him, primarily he says my father because he looked over 300 and supplied 350 sharecroppers and he said he never foreclosed on one of them. Never foreclosed on one of them. No matter what their hardships were, no matter what their struggles were, never foreclosed on any of them because he said, my dad was a compassionate man. So the, primarily the word being used from his mouth was compassion. My dad was compassionate. And I see this man also as a compassionate man. And so you can see the virtues of the father coming through the son. You can see the same thing, virtues of the mothers going through the daughters and the sons. It makes a difference. I can remember my rebellious days, and, and when I was out there doing whatever I wanted to, it was my mother that walked the driveway at night. My dad was still sleeping. You know, he didn't wake up unless she woke him up. And some of the times, the things that we did to hurt him, we, we regret that, but I thank God for all the good memories of where in the latter years of her life, you know, it was constantly, every day, I love you, and her saying back, I love you. So it's powerful when you and I have these precious memories knowing that they've gone on to glory and we're going to be with them in their presence, in the presence of Jesus Christ forever and ever. For the Bible says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has entered in the hearts of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Amen? But he's revealed them to us by his spirit. So we have a ton of memories, people that we know as far as in, our, in the family of God. People that sometimes are going through heartache right now because of a loss even this past week of a of a man that was very dear, really the nucleus of the family, were praying for that family because he was killed in a, a motorcycle accident this past week of time. And, you know, you just say, it's devastating, God. How in the world can something so terrible like this happen? And yet God is there to pick these people up, to hold them dear, to bring encouragement in their life and comfort in their life. He tells us to comfort one another with the same comfort where we ourselves have also been comforted. And the only way you can comfort someone is with the love of God. They might not want to hear it right away. Maybe it doesn't bring the healing that you want it to bring right away. But God will bring it. For his word will never return unto him void. It will accomplish that in which he's been pleased to send it. It will prosper in every area where God sends it. And I praise the Lord for that. Amen. Let's look at our, first, our next scripture right here in the book of Luke. Let's just jump past this when I mentioned this a while ago. Luke 1.26 what I like about this is with Mary. Now, here she is, a girl, and the Bible identifies her as a girl that was in Nazareth. So it's a, a poor area of the region. Here she is engaged to a man. Now she's going to be expecting a child without ever knowing the man. She's a virgin, and so many things can happen to her. I mean, the engagement at that point, which is really a committal for marriage, can be broken off. She can even lose her life and be stoned to death. Uh, she can be ridiculed if she's not stoned to death and, and bringing up a child, saying that she had this child out of wedlock with someone beside Joseph, but God just did a miraculous work, telling her by sending Gabriel. I love the story of Gabriel because you find out Gabriel, when he appears on the scene, always says something like, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of the Lord. I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of the Lord, and I've been sent to communicate to you what God would have me communicate. Isn't that what God the Holy Spirit does? 
communicates blessings in our life, always lifting us up. Always, we fret about things, and God says, why did you fret about them? Why did you worry about them? Cast them upon me, and I'll give you peace, he says. Look at what it says here. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. In 27, to a virgin espoused, engaged, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. It goes on to say, and the angel came in unto her and said, Hell, thou art, here it is, women, Thou art highly favored. Now we say, well, Mary was highly favored. Mary was highly favored because she birthed the Lord Jesus Christ, conceived of the Holy Spirit. But I want you to realize you're highly favored because you birth a child and then you birth into their life the Lord Jesus Christ by speaking it to them all the time. The Bible says when you're lying down, when you're setting up, when you're walking by the way, Deuteronomy 6 says, Tell them, use these scriptures as frontless before their eyes. Understand, as I mentioned, that there's people putting scriptures upon their gateposts. They put them on maybe different signposts around their property. We do that. My wife does that. She likes to make signs. One of them might say, by the way, nothing is impossible with God. The other one says over here by this trail that I will teach you the paths of life. In his presence is the fullness of joy. In his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 1611. I mean, you see it constantly, the Word of God, blessings. You and I are highly favored. We are greatly blessed, amen? God deserves the praise, honor, and glory for that. Here she is, Gabriel saying, I've come from the Lord. I'm telling you that you're highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed art thou among women, 29. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the Bible says, an angel said unto her, fear not. Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. There's no reason to fear. Now, we're going to look at that again in a moment because my wife and I last week were going over a scripture. We were talking about fear. As a parent, many times, you can have fear. Many mothers, as I mentioned, they, they have fear. Like I said, my mother, she had fear because here I'm out with a car. She doesn't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm out past curfew, and she doesn't know what's going on. The main thing is, oh, I'm worrying. You know, In those days, you didn't have a cell phone. You couldn't text. I mean, you know, it was just no communication. And so you didn't know where they were. And yet, there was worry. And with that worry comes fear. And Jesus Christ says, He's the deliverer of our worry. He's the deliverer of our fear. And so we understand, according to God's word in Galatians 3.13, He's redeemed us from the curse of the law, for cursed is every man that hangeth upon a tree. But Deuteronomy 28 ends up by saying, He's redeemed you from the curse of fear. That's what he's done. It's so wonderful to know that we have a Savior that has certainly watched over our lives. He said, I will give my angels charge concerning you to keep you in all your ways like you would even dash your foot against the stone. He said, well, that didn't happen, Lord, to me. I had a terrible experience. God is the one, he says, that bends the broken heart. I've come, he says, to heal the brokenhearted. I've shared that scripture, whether it's out of the book of Isaiah or the book of Luke, with people that are suffering. God's come to mend the brokenhearted. He will mend your heart. He will strengthen your heart. And that's so necessary when you're facing difficult situations. It says here, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. Jehovah, Yeshua saves, he says. What does he save us from? He saved us from the penalty of sin, which is death. He tells us he's given us life and that life is more abundant. Not sometime later, but right now. The greatest thing that you have is Jesus. He's the center of your life. He's the one that's given you everlasting life. The Holy Spirit, I pray that you will open that up and help all of us to see that, that you have everlasting life abiding within you. The Bible tells us that He's the resurrection, He's the life. Amen? Let's jump down here to our next scripture. It says this. Now, this is in the Passion Translation, and I have some of them some of these scriptures today will be using this, but this is the song of Mary in the 46th verse. It says, and Mary sang this song, my soul is ecstatic. I mean, that's what God, when he comes in, I'm ecstatic. I, I, I leap for joy. My soul is ecstatic, overflowing with praises to God. 47. It says, do you have 47? Okay, look at that. It says here in... 47, my spirit bursts with joy over my life-giving God. Amen? 
Jesus Christ came to give you life, as I already mentioned, and give it to you more abundantly. Yes, certainly Satan comes to rob, kill, and destroy, but Christ came to give you life. The blessings you have in your life is because we have a life-giving God. Amen? Life-giving God. Praise the Lord for that. It says, for he set his tender gaze upon me. Notice that. I want you to understand, as I mentioned with Song of Solomon so many times, 4th chapter, 8th verse, message translation. One look at you, and I was hopelessly in love, God said. <laughs> he set his tender gaze upon me, his lowly servant girl, and from here on, and from here on, from right now on, everyone will know that I have been favored and blessed. Amen? Don't just say that's for her, it's for you too. Why? Because I said she birthed the Messiah, but you're the one who birthed the child, and the Bible says with that birth, you speak the blessings of the Messiah into that child's life. I want you to look at this next scripture right here. It's found in the book of Psalms 113.9 because what I want you to get out of this in the passage translation is to understand that some people say, well, I'm barren. I don't have anyone. Well, there was another lady that was barren, Sarah. And I'm not asking you if you're past the age of childbearing for the Lord to perform the miracle of Sarah. And you might not even want that miracle. But I want you to understand that here was a woman, Sarah, that said to Abraham, why don't you take my handmaid, Hagar, Hagar, and through that, you'll have a baby. And maybe that's going to be the way God blesses us. So Ishmael comes forth, which means warrior. And God says, nope, that's not the way. Later, Sarah was the one that birthed Isaac. His name means laughter. It shows you something. Number one, we had a woman offering her husband to another woman. That doesn't work. And that was through our fleshly, physical way of provision, and you find out that way is always a war-type way. It's a way that's a battle. It's a struggle. There's nothing easy about it whatsoever. But when you have someone that's receiving the blessings of the Lord, this is done through God's avenue, Isaac, laughter. He says there's joy, there's laughter, there's exceeding gratefulness. And so in this verse here, it says, God's grace provides for the barren ones a joyful home with children. Now, even the barren. I've said many times there's women that I've met that have never had a child, yet they have the heart of a mother. And they've been a blessing, and they continue to be a blessing because of that. It says, God's grace provides for the barren ones a joyful home with children so that even childless couples find a family. He makes them happy parents surrounded by their pride and joy. That's the God we praise, so give it all to Him. Amen? That's the God we praise. And I say that because it leads us into this story with a person who didn't have any children but was greatly blessed because of a child. It's found in the book of Esther here. It was with Mordecai. You know the story, right? I mean, here we have Queen Esther. We have Queen Esther who has just this wonderful life not really, but the uncle Mordecai directed her to a wonderful life. She became the queen to the king of Persia because of her uncle. Now, her father and mother had passed away. She was an orphan. And so we're, here we have this king that was looking for a bride, a queen, and there was a given day where all the women that he appointed would come before him and he would choose a wife and it happened to be because she had a strong father, Mordecai, even though she had lost her father and mother. It's the fulfillment of what God says in Psalm 113.9, which, which we just read. It says, for he brought up Hadassah. Now, her name was Hadassah, that is Esther. There's a difference here. Hadassah means myrtle. Esther means that she's a star. Now, when you look at a story, you say, well, let's compare this situation. Here we have a myrtle tree that might be on a mountain, and you have a star up in the sky. Let's compare the two. Well, the myrtle tree provides shade. It's beautiful, no question about it. But it kind of provides shade for only those that are underneath its limbs. But on the other hand, when you look up at a star, it's brightening the sky. It actually is creating or granting light to many of us. But I think there's something else to consider here. A candle 
brings light only when it expends itself. A star brings light only when it expends itself. Mothers have expended themselves in a self-sacrificial type of way. Not only do they give their body in the carrying and their body in the delivery, but they give their heart to this child all the years of their life, saying that even though they grow up and they leave my household, they still have my heart. A mother's always expending herself, always granting some type of light to the family. And that only happens. It doesn't happen in a, you know, any other way but self-sacrificial. And I can remember a mom that did without, so the kids had. I can remember a story of, of a, a grandfather of a, of a lady that's in this church right now. They went through some tough times years ago now. It was her grandfather's father, by the way. And it was during the, the, uh, the times of the Depression, and there wasn't enough food for everybody on the table. So he let the children eat. He got up and went for a walk, even though he was starving and didn't eat. I can remember stories of, of my mother going through the Depression in Camden, New Jersey, and of course there was, it hit throughout. Her sister running up to a house and knocking on the door and said, if you don't give me something to eat, I'm going to throw myself in front of the next car going, going down the road. I mean, suffering times. No question about it, but appreciating times. The greatest generation we ever had coming through World War II and still many of them living to today. But fathers and mothers that knew what it meant to be blessed by God and a blessing to God, you find out here with Queen Esther, a star, someone that was willing to expend her life, realizing that she's kind of like the mother of the Jewish people right here. I mean, if she, she doesn't come forth, now we understand that God says, you know, if she doesn't do it, you'll have someone else to do it. But you know, Mordecai says, you've been brought to this area for such a time as this. Amen? And so that's exactly what took place. It says here, and he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took her for his own daughter. How many people have impacted individuals? I know that there's ministers today, pastors, one of them I can think of, who had a fatherless home, but yet he said there was a certain man in his life that was a father to him. Maybe you're a father to someone, or you're a mother to someone. You're impacting someone's life, maybe in your neighborhood. And God planted you there for such a purpose as this, that you can speak a word of encouragement into someone's life because that shows me and shows everyone else that the Holy Spirit's ministering to you because He always speaks a word of encouragement. I don't care if it's from a pulpit or from your pulpit. God has it in these places. Look at the next verse here. It says in the 4th chapter, 16th verse, So gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go into the, under the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, she says, I perish. I'm willing to give my life. How many mothers have been willing to give their life? And this is really the mother of the Jewish people, like I already mentioned. God showing us a person's name, very valuable. He changed it even to Esther. She's known as a star. She's granting light to the people of Israel. It's a powerful thing. Praise be to the Lord. Let's look at this next verse here with me, please. It says here in Proverbs, the sixth chapter, 20 through 22, in the Passion Translation, my son, obey your father's godly instruction and follow your mother's life-giving teaching, it says. Look at 21. Fill your heart with their advice and let your life be shaped by what they've taught you. In 22, their wisdom will guide you wherever you go and keep you from bringing harm to yourself. Their instruction will whisper to you at every sunrise and direct you through a brand new day. Now leave that up there for a moment because let's take this in. Who is it that's talking here? We know it's Solomon. God has blessed us. He says or blessed him to be one of the wisest men in the entire world. Yet, who was his father and who was his mother? David was his father. Bathsheba was his mother. Obviously, he says, tremendously wise people placed over me, but I want you to understand this. It was David who was a type of Christ. We realize he has an established throne, he says, in Israel, whereby Jesus will rule and reign there forever and ever. So we have here the instructions of the Holy Spirit. Realize when you're lying there, he's the one that's shaping your life. 
with these instructions. He's the one, he says, that whispers them to you at every sunrise and directs you through a brand new day. Amen? I mean, how many times we get up and we, we fall on our knees and say, God, I need wisdom for today. And God says, that's exactly what I gave you through Jesus Christ. I use this scripture so many times. 1 Corinthians 1.30. In Christ, I have wisdom, I have righteousness, I have sanctification, and I have redemption. Therefore, let no flesh glory in the presence of the Lord. So, so when I get up, sometimes I already say, well, why do I ask for something I already have? I already have wisdom. I'm already righteous. I'm sanctified and made holy. As holy as Jesus because he made me that way. He says, I've been redeemed. The, the ultimate price has been paid for me. That's how valuable God sees you and sees me. The ultimate price has been paid. And don't think that if one sparrow falls to the ground without God noticing it, how much more valuable are you than many sparrows, he says. And so we so many times say, God, you see what's going on in my life? You say, God says, you know what? I'm the one that has declared unto you that I am going to work this together for good. Promise you that. You can understand that, that I'm not a man that I should lie, neither the son of man that I should repent. Have I not said it, shall I not do it? Have I not spoken, shall I not make it good? God is good to his word, amen? He truly is. Thank you, Jesus. You're so good to your word. Look at this in 2 Timothy, please, with me. Now in this, uh, we have Paul who really has a mother, he says, and a grandmother that were influential in his life. But the reason why I'm bringing this out, and, and because we have a scripture after this one in the book of Isaiah, the 54th chapter, and I don't know, for some reason when we get older, it seems like we battle fear more. I don't, I don't know. Or, or fear thoughts rise up, but as soon as they rise up, they're to be cast down. And that's not something you can do. Like I said so many times, it's not a ping pong match. It's not a tennis match. It's not you fighting against the enemy with one scripture. He comes back to you with another. It's you and I resting in the Lord Jesus Christ. For surely goodness and mercy shall follow you, shall hunt you down and overtake you all the days of your life, and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I, uh, he says in Psalm 23, 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. It shall hunt me down. It shall overtake me. I'm not going to read the passion, but it also brings that same thought into mind. But he says here, I remember your genuine faith, as Paul writes to a young man by the name of Timothy. He has two young pastors working under him, Timothy and Titus. They're being used of God to go out and declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. I remember your genuine love, he says, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith continues strong in you. Amen? Look at what he says. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. And then finally he says this, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Power, love, and a sound mind, the Bible says. Christ is the reason why you and I have a sound mind. We have the mind of Christ, the wisdom of Christ, the power of Christ, the life of Christ, all these things given to us freely in Christ Jesus. What's the good news today? Jesus Christ. Is there any bad news if you got Jesus? Sorry, there's not. And so I say that because I wanted to get to this scripture. It's a scripture I think is very powerful in the book of Isaiah. Look at what he says in 54. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. All your children. Now, this is what I want you to see right here. This is one that my wife and I were going over last week. We took time, went through it, and it was a blessing. It says this, In righteousness shalt thou be established. Understand, in righteousness. Whose righteousness? The righteousness of Christ. Does it ever change? No, it never changes. He says he's given you his righteousness. Christ became sin for us who never knew any sin. That you and I would be made. We're made the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. You have been made righteous in the sight of God through the righteousness that God has given you through Christ Jesus our Lord. So where is guilt then? Where is, con where is boasting? It can't be. It's all in Jesus. In righteous shalt thou be established. In, I'm established in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, thou shalt be far from oppression... For thou shalt not fear. This, this is the part that my wife and I were really meditating on last week. I will be far from oppression, for I have been delivered from fear. I shall not fear, 
Fear is part of the curse, we realize. I'm not under the curse, I'm under the blessings of God. I'm under everything that Jesus Christ has given to me. He says, I have all spiritual blessings in high places through Christ Jesus my Lord. I'm forgiven of all my sin, he says. Everything I've been forgiven, everything has been washed away. Your sins and iniquities I will remember no more, he says. God doesn't remember them, why are you and I hung up on them? He says, thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee, says. That's what I speak in the name of Jesus. You know, there's times when you could communicate, like I said, if somebody's worrying, and say, you know what, I'm not going to worry. I can say that, it doesn't work. But you know, in Jesus Christ, he's taken away my fear. He's taken away my worry. Look at what he says here. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. 16, behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and bringeth forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the waster to destroy. But 17 says, no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. He also says, in every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn this is our heritage, people. This is what highly favored mothers speak into their highly favored children, what Jesus Christ has done. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of who? Is of me, saith the Lord. Amen? Our righteousness is of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's look at this now, Philippians 14. It says 12 and 13. I only do this because of the, pass the uh, Passion Translation you know, you can look at this in several translations, get a lot out of it. I know that you and I understand 13. The Bible says in 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notice how it says it this way. I know what it means to lack, and I know what it means to experience overwhelming abundance. For I am trained in the secret of overcoming all things, whether in fullness or in hunger, and I find that the strength of Christ, explosive power. Understand? I mean, you could talk about this in the King James you can look at this in the Amplified, but the Passion says, Jesus, I can do all things through Christ, through the explosive power of Jesus Christ, the supernatural power of Jesus Christ is in your life. And I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. Why? Because He's the great conqueror. He's the one that went before me. He's the one that made the way. So let's just celebrate our mothers as we close with this one. Proverbs 31, 25 through 31 in the Passion Translation, it says this. Bold power and glorious majesty are wrapped around her. Let's speak this into our mother's lives. Amen. As she laughs with joy over the latter days. 26. Her teachings are filled with wisdom and kindness as, instruct, as loving instruction pours from her lips. You know what? I've had some mothers say... You know, that doesn't really identify me. That just depresses me every time I read that one. What? Listen to what God says. This is what he, look, someone's opinion of you doesn't dictate God's destiny for you. Realize what he said. Her teachings are filled with wisdom and kindness as loving instruction pours from her mouth, her lips. She watches over the ways of her household and meets every need they have. 28, her sons and daughters are rising one accord to extol her virtues and her husband arise to speak of her in glowing terms. 29, there are many valiant and noble ones, but you have ascended above them all. Hallelujah. Making her feel real good. Thank you, Jesus, because that's who she is. Charm can be misleading and beauty is vain and so quickly fades, but this virtuous woman lives in the wonder, awe, and fear of the Lord. That is not servial, that's filial. So will be praised throughout eternity. Amen. 31, so go ahead and give her the credit as due. Hallelujah, thank you, mothers. For she has become a radiant woman, and all her loving works of righteousness deserve to be admired at the gateways of every city. Hallelujah, praise be to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah for our mothers. We give you glory. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I want to thank you today for how awesome you truly are and how you continue to cause your word to come alive in our life because it's the one who's alive in our life, Jesus Christ. And I thank you, God, that you're always there to tell us even regarding the Spirit. Jesus, you said you would send one just like yourself, just like yourself, who would lead and guide us into all truth. He would tell us how righteous we are, tell us the enemy's already defeated, 
And tell us we have the abundant life in you forever. I thank you, God, for all these whispers of your loves that you have declared that are new every morning. And great truly is your faithfulness. So, Lord, today I just praise you for the rich blessings found in Christ Jesus our Lord. I pray for a special blessing to be upon every single mother, those who born and those who haven't born. For you're the one who says, I will hook you up to where you have children, you have a family that you're going to impact, that you're going to be an encourager to, that you're going to let them know that they're not a myrtle tree, they're a star. Let you know that they've actually come on the scene for such a time as this. To let them know that they have an eternal destiny, that God has a wonderful plan. And He intends to be exalted through their life and through the lives of those that are blessing them. So, Father, take these highly favored mothers. Help them to continue to be used as far as highly favored mothers speaking that great favor to the lives of those that are around them. Always reminding us and extolling one another, encouraging one another, exhorting one another of how great our Lord Jesus Christ is. And to you we give all the praise, honor, and glory for we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. And all of God's children said, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Let's get on our feet. Let's sing Jesus at the center. Jesus at the center of it all.